I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, and we're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today we'll be talking about the legal history of Roe v. Wade and the crisis our nation is facing since it's been overturned. We'll be talking with Jeffrey R. Stone, a distinguished law professor and an expert on constitutional law. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Jeffrey R. Stone is the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. His many books on constitutional law and free speech include Sex and the Constitution, Sex, Religion, and Law from Americans' Origins to the 21st Century. He's an expert in abortion rights law, and in fact, later on in the program, we're going to see a clip of Professor Stone talking with the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Jeffrey Stone is on the faculty and has served as Dean of the University of Chicago Law School. He serves on the National Advisory Council of the ACLU and is also, we're proud to say, an honorary director of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us again on Free Thought Matters, Professor Stone. My pleasure, always. So the last time we spoke with you, we interviewed you a year ago last summer, and you sagely predicted that Roe versus Wade would be overturned before its 50th anniversary, and that's exactly what happened. And in fact, you've predicted that for some years. That's probably one prophecy you wish you'd gotten wrong. Absolutely. <laughs> years ago, you were a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice William J. Brennan. Did you have a front seat when Roe v. Wade was handed down? Yeah, I, I was a, a, a law clerk to Justice Brennan in the year that Roe was decided. So I was there. Um, and, you know, what was interesting about it is that uh, five of the six Republican appointed justices, including three of the four justices appointed by Richard Nixon, uh, voted in support of uh, Roe v. Wade and the right of women to terminate unwanted pregnancies. Um, that shows how non political the decision was at the time. Indeed, in the years since Roe, um, including the justices in Roe, um, nine of the 11 justices not sitting on the court today, nine of the 11 justices not on the court today, um, who were Republican appointed, voted to uphold Roe v. Wade. So the court we have today is uh, completely different from anyone we've had in the last 50 years, including among Republican appointed justices. So before we ask for your opinion of the Dobbs opinion, overturning Roe versus Wade, I thought you could uh, briefly tell us the story behind how Roe versus Wade got reasoned and written. Roe v. Wade was decided, uh, first of all, at a time when the women's rights movement was um, becoming important, and the justices were quite aware of that, and m most of them were quite sympathetic to it. Um, and that affected their willingness, for example, under the Equal Protection Clause to strike down laws that discriminated against women for the first time in history. Uh, with respect to the issue of abortion, they obviously saw this in a way that men had never really seen it before as a injustice towards the freedom and autonomy of women. But two things in particular, I think, uh, really moved them in this regard. Uh, the first was that at 
the time Roe was decided, most people, including the justices, um, assumed that abortion had always been illegal from time immemorial. And one of the things they learned, both from the book, from the briefs, and also from uh, Justice Blackmun's research, uh, was that that was completely wrong. That from the ancient Greeks and Romans, all the way through the time the Constitution was adopted until uh, the middle of the 19th century in the United States, abortion was legal, uh, up, at least up to the point of quickening, that is the midpoint of pregnancy. And it was not seen as particularly controversial. Although the Catholic Church opposed that, uh, it was not illegal uh, pre-quickening anywhere um, in the Western world until the mid-19th century. And that really shocked the justices in terms of understanding how um, non-historical uh, the uh, law that had developed was. And the second thing that uh, affected them is before this time, most women who had illegal abortions, we're talking about two million a year, um, did not talk to anyone but close friends and family members about their experience because it was illegal to have an, an abortion. And therefore, most people had no idea of what that experience was like. And as that came to the forefront, the justices were horrified. The idea of self-abortion um, with uh, women on their own uh, using tools that were horrible to think of, screwdrivers and so on, um, and women having back alley abortions performed by people they didn't know and couldn't see, uh, gave the justices an understanding of how awful the reality of a world that prohibited abortion was. And so that's what led them, the seven justices in the majority, to decide the case the way they did. And even the two justices who dissented, Justice William Rehnquist and Justice Byron White, wrote very modest dissents. Um, so at the time, uh, Roe was not very controversial. Um, a significant majority of people supported it. Um, and when John Paul Stevens was nominated to the Supreme Court several years later by President um, uh, Gerald Ford, um, not a single member of Congress asked him a question about Roe v. Wade or the issue of abortion. It just wasn't seen as controversial at that time. Yeah, what a different world. And you did have that front row seat. That must have been awfully exciting to be a law clerk. It was very exciting. It was very exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that was one of the highlights of uh, my year on the as a law clerk. Um, and, and one of the things that makes me even more upset about Dobbs than I would be if I hadn't been there. But I'd be terribly upset either way. Um, but this is a sort of a personal interest in it that makes it even more of an insult. Of Did the clerks see the decisions before they're published? Oh, yeah, they helped to write them. Wow. Absolutely. So you yeah, knew... The clerks are, are very much involved in the entire process. So you knew um, what was coming. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, the law clerks basically draft the opinions for the justices, and you're in constant contact with your own justice talking about how, how they should vote, what they think about the case, what the, what the proper reasoning is. And if they're writing an opinion, the law clerks typically uh, will write drafts that are reviewed by the other clerks or by the justice, um, and then by the other justices uh, and their clerks. So now let's fast forward at least four decades on the 40th anniversary of... Or the 40th year. 40th year of Roe versus Wade since then. You had an amazing conversation with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we do want to share just a brief clip from that that was at the University of Chicago in 2013. Um, when you were a young woman, um, what was it like? What were the options available to, for a woman who found herself with an unwanted pregnancy? What was, what was the world like for someone faced with that dilemma? For most young women, it was to marry the guy. And that's what happened, and I don't think that that was a recipe for living happily ever after. Uh, some people, in the, uh, abortion was criminal in the United States, so if a woman found a, a doctor or anyone willing to perform a, an abortion, she was taking a tremendous risk. If you were well healed, well, there were places you could go abroad. So Cuba, I think, was the nearest place, but some people went to Switzerland or as far as Japan. 
But for most, most um, young women, the not solution, but the only, the only way to deal with it was to marry the. So most people don't realize, by the way, that, that in the United States until the late 19th century, uh, abortion was not a crime until uh, quickening, which was basically the midpoint of pregnancy. Um, and it was only in the 1870s and later that uh, abortion became a crime uh, in most jurisdictions from day one. So that's really fun to see you two together. That must have been quite a moment. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I knew uh, Justice Ginsburg fairly well, and it was a real privilege uh, to have that conversation with her. You can see how thoughtful she is. She was just always listening very carefully to everything that was said. And, of course, you can watch that entire interview if you go to YouTube. But I was interested in your remarks, again, that directly contradict the pinnacle, really, of Justice Samuel Alito's decision in the Dobbs case that was handed down on June 24th over turning Roe versus Wade. And he claims, I think, on that very first page of his decision that abortion has always been illegal in America. So he's rewriting history, right? Well, to the extent that is in the opinion, that would certainly be rewriting history. Um, most of what Alito is focused on is that by the time the 14th Amendment was enacted, um, uh, half or a majority of the states had moved to outlaw abortion. Um, and this was due largely to the Second Great Awakening, um, to a very powerful religious movement in the country um, that developed well after the original Constitution was adopted, and that took the position that a fetus was a person from the time of conception. And that had an enormous impact. Um, and the other argument that was important was a total disregard for the interests of the woman. Uh, the idea was that uh, women had an Eve-like nature and that men couldn't trust them uh, not to go out and have sex, either premarriage or extramarital. And one of the ways to protect them and to protect their, their men was to um, require uh, no abortions. So therefore, they'd be caught if they engaged in this kind of behavior. And that was a major theme at, at this time. So that was child, um, childbirth was a the punishment then, but, right? Yeah, well, exactly. That's, that's right out of Genesis 3.16, give forth uh, yeah. children in sorrow. Um, wow. So, so uh, religious roots there. And um, I'm wondering if you, uh, you know, we've got about two minutes left on, on this segment. Uh, can you also, what else was wrong with that decision, I mean, in, historically? Well, I mean, I, first of all, I think that, that um, the Dobbs decision was wrong uh, in many ways. Uh, historically, I think uh, Justice Alito's opinion uh, discounts, uh, A, the extent to which abortion had been legal um, through all of Western history until the uh, mid-19th century, um, and he also discounts the reasons why it was made illegal, which are not admirable um, and should not be regarded as uh, respectful or weighty. Um, he disregards all of that. Um, and he disregards the fact that it was largely a religious movement um, that is not supposed to play a critical role in American law and American constitutional law. Um, and uh, the other thing he does historically, I think, is to uh, discount uh, how the framers of the Constitution themselves uh, would never have imagined that abortion would be made illegal. That was simply never, it never happened pre-quickening in their world or in history. And the idea that this was something they could ever have imagined happening is simply wrong. And I think that we've seen some of this interesting um, evidence that Thomas Jefferson's daughter was involved in helping her cousin get an abortion. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, all, there's all kinds of things contradicting that r record. But perhaps the worst thing is that the originalists are treating the Constitution like it's, uh, like the fundamentalists treat the Bible. You know, we consider it, I consider it a living Constitution. Don't you? Yes. And obviously, the originalists don't think of it that way 
<clears throat> unless it enables them to reach the results they want to reach. Yeah. Uh, now, in defense of, of Alito, I do want to say that uh, because of the factors I mentioned earlier, by the time the court adopted the 14th Amendment, uh, more than half of the states had adopted laws restricting abortion. And therefore, if the originalist perspective is what did the framers of the 14th Amendment believe about abortion, A, they certainly did not affirmatively believe that the 14th Amendment made laws uh, prohibiting uh, allowing abortion um, uh, constitutional or unconstitutional. The 14th Amendment, in their mind, had nothing to do with that. Um, and uh, therefore, from his perspective, at least it's fair to say that if you take a strict originalist position, uh, it would be hard to say that the framers of the 14th Amendment um, intended that amendment to have anything to do with the issue of abortion. In fact, they did not. Um, well, original to the 18th, 17th century, 18th century or 19th century. We have to take a break, Professor Stone, and we are going to look at a little clip of some recent remarks that Supreme Court Justice Alito made, which seems to make light of all the chaos the decision has created, and we would like your reaction to that. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Charlotte and I'm an out of the closet atheist. I've always been intrigued by religion and when I was younger, I desperately wanted to be religious, to be more accepted by my family who was in majority Catholic. My parents didn't raise me religious. I was never baptized, I never took communion. Well, once I took communion, uh, it was a pretty bad idea. I don't think it was worth a church full of angry elderly who glared at me as I waved the communion wafer back and forth asking my grandma what should be done with it. Also, the wine was pretty gross. From this experience and countless others, I came to three conclusions that sort of dictate how I live my secular life. One is that I find people of faith to be more exclusionary and less accepting. Two is that I would rather work to please the people around me who I care about than someone who, to my knowledge, doesn't exist. And three, that I would rather help people than pray for them. We are continuing our conversation with Professor Jeffrey Stone, an expert on abortion rights law, about what the new Supreme Court ultra-conservative supermajority got wrong in the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. But before we continue, let's watch this clip, this recent clip of Justice Alito, who wrote that decision. He's talking about it here in Notre Dame, in a conference for Notre Dame. I had the honor this term of writing, I think, the only Supreme Court decision in the history of that institution that has been lambasted by a whole string of foreign leaders <laughs> who felt perfectly fine commenting on American law. One of these was uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, but he paid the price. <laughs> Post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? <laughs> but others are still, yeah, are still in office. President Macron and uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau, I believe, are too. 
But what really wounded me, what really wounded me was when the Duke of Sussex addressed the <laughs> United Nations and seemed to compare the decision whose name may not be spoken with the Russian attack on Ukraine. That was just a small part of a long talk Alito gave. He was in Rome there. Uh, what is your take on his remarks and on his attitude? Well, I mean, I think he uh, is not taking very seriously the criticism of the opinion in Dobbs, and uh, both in terms of uh, American constitutional law and in terms of morals. Um, the fact is that uh, the view that the court adopted in Dobbs is very much driven by religious belief. And uh, that's not supposed to be what determines the meaning of the American Constitution. Um, but his view uh, is he, he apparently can't separate his constitutional responsibility from his religious belief. And that's, I would say, that's true for all five of the justices in the majority. And that's tragic because that's completely inconsistent with the assumption about why we give the Supreme Court the kind of power we do. Uh, we are not supposed to have an establishment of religion in this country. And yet the driving force behind that decision was not political conservatism. As I said earlier, the vast majority of the conservative justices to sit on the court from Roe to, to Dobbs uh, voted in support of Roe v. Wade. It was driven, I believe, very much by their religious beliefs. Well, the, and, the six of them who voted were all raised Roman Catholic. Of course, Gorsuch migrated to Episcopalianism. We have one liberal, you know, Catholic in so Sonia Sotomayor. But, I, I mean, we can't ignore that, can we? Well, the point is not that all Catholics are conservative. Justice Brennan, whom I was a law clerk, who was very liberal, was Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, the point is that they were selected to be on the Supreme Court because of their views on abortion. That's and right. e even though they were, some of them were, were somewhat dishonest in their hearings by saying, well, I don't really know how I would vote on this case. Um, I believe they did. And the fact that, that um, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Barrett uh, voted to overrule Roe within a few years of being put on the court um, speaks volumes about how determined they were to do this as soon as the opportunity presented itself. Yes, I thought that maybe they might, that Coney Barrett might wait a year before yeah, well, her two colors. Yeah, to Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, which was much more modest, and to leave it for another year or five or whatever um, before leaping to the, uh, to the exercise of uh, a very highly problematic uh, form of constitutional interpretation. Uh, let me add one other point about why Dobbs is a bad decision. Um, the doctrine of precedent is fundamental in American law, and particularly in American constitutional law. Uh, what it means is that courts, even if they disagree with prior decisions, will respect those prior decisions rather than overrule them. The reason for this is because you want the law to be consistent, you want it to be depoliticized, uh, you don't want justices to be selected because they happen to disagree with past decisions. And that's a fundamental premise of what makes American law stable and principled. Um, in this case, uh, none of the reasons that the court in the past has put forth justifying overruling a prior decision, uh, most commonly that the past decision uh, didn't work out the way the justices intended. So like in Brown v. Board of Education, when the court overruled Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, the court said at the time of Plessy, the justices did not understand the extent to which segregation would have a seriously de deleterious effect on blacks. And by the time we got to 1954, that was something we had learned um, and that that justified the decision overruling Plessy. And that's true in many decisions. Um, the other thing that's interesting about when the court overrules prior decisions, it is almost always to expand individual freedoms, not to contract them. Uh. And in that sense, the decision that Dobbs is completely inconsistent with the ordinary practice of the court. Some uh, scholars are saying that this current 
court is not really conservative in the traditional sense of what it means to be a conservative, that this current court is reactionary. Do you agree with that? Well, we haven't seen them long enough to know exactly what they will be doing. But in, in the first couple of years of their um, dominance, I think that's right. And the fact that Justice Chief Justice Roberts um, is moving in a centrist position, um, he was considered very conservative when he was uh, nominated. Um, and he had voted in a number of decisions during his tenure that were thought of by others as quite conservative. But he has clearly moved into a central position, not because Roberts has changed, but because these other justices have gone off uh, the right wing to a really unprecedented degree, and literally unprecedented. There has not been a Supreme Court with this degree of political and religious ideology dominating their jurisprudence, um, maybe in American history. So, so distressing to see this. We have only one minute left. Any parting words um, about what's next or court reform? Any, any thoughts? The court is not only likely to uh, invalidate laws about affirmative action and campaign finance, but uh, one of the questions dramatically raised by the opinion of Alito and Dobbs is whether the court will then go further and hold laws um, uh, that allow contraception, uh, or law, differently, laws that prohibit contraception uh, constitutional, laws that uh, prohibit same-sex marriage uh, constitutional, um, and even laws that protect the rights of women, um, they may hold to be constitutional. Uh, that, that, I'm sorry, that, that violate the rights of women, they may hold unconstitutional. Uh, so the opinion in Dobbs ca carries with it implications that are very damaging to the American people and to the culture that is at the core of our democracy. So they it's sure a, do. It's a rocky road ahead. Thank you so much, Professor Stone. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Always my pleasure. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.